should be on. Are we on? Good, good. Welcome to worship, each and every one of you. It's good to be with you today. As I looked at the announcements on the pink sheet, and that's the one that is, is available for you in the back, um, there's a lot of announcements here that should be brought to your attention. I, I have not been given specific instructions as to which ones to lift up. However, I do know that with the annual meeting coming up that we do want to lift up uh, an announcement about that. That is January 30th at approximately 1140. It will be after the uh, second worship service. And then with, with the other announcements that are here, some things that caught my attention, of course, there's always the music opportunities with the choir, and you're invited to do that, and the handbells, and I even saw that a youth handbells is back for grades three through seven, and that rehearsal will also be on Wednesdays from five to 5.30, so uh, please do the, the contacting if you have any questions in regard to that. And also the Bible studies and education, care for creation, uh, lots of, of information there. Uh, especially it'll be next Sunday that, that the movie will be taking place between uh, worship services. There is not an adult forum today, so uh, I guess it's just coffee and, and a chance to visit with one another today during that time. Also, volunteer opportunities for uh, Sunday evening meal serving, and that would be for the Salvation Army, and always worship ass assistants are, are coveted as we uh, gather for worship every Sunday. Are there announcements of which you are aware that should be uh, brought to our attention? Anyone? All right. If not, I would ask that we, st we stand as you're able and we will turn to our confession and forgiveness. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Most merciful God, we confess that we cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Called to baptize, we witness to grace and gather a people from each land and race. In deep flowing waters, we share in Christ's death. Then rising to new life, give thanks with each breath.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. In peace, in peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the reign of God and for peace throughout the world, for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For your people here who have come to give you praise, for the strength to live your word, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, and defend us, O God. Amen. Now the feast and all of creation sings for joy to the God of life and love and freedom, praise and glory forevermore. Now is the feast of a lamb once slain, whose blood has freed and With you. And also with you. Let us pray. Lord God, source of every blessing, you showed forth your glory and led many to faith by the works of your Son, who brought gladness and salvation to his people. Transform us by the spirit of his love, that we may find our life together in him, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The first lesson is written in the 62nd chapter of Isaiah. For Zion's sake I will not keep silent, and for Jerusalem's sake I will not rest until her vindication shines out like the dawn and her salvation like a burning torch. The nation shall see your vindication and all the kings your glory, and you shall be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will give. You shall be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. You shall no more be termed forsaken, and your land shall no more be termed desolate, but you shall be called, my delight is in her. And your land married, for the Lord delights in you, and your land shall be married. For as a young man marries a young woman, so shall your builder marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. Here ends the first lesson. The second reading is from the 12th chapter of 1 Corinthians. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were enticed and led astray to idols that could not speak. 
Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking by the Spirit of God ever says, let Jesus be cursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of services, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who activates all of them in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the discernment of spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. All these are activated by one and the same Spirit who allots to each one individually just as the Spirit chooses. Here ends the lesson. As you are able, would you please stand for the gospel affirmation. gospel for this day is recorded for us in the gospel of St. John, chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. Glory to you, o Lord. On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee. The mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples were also invited to the wedding. When the wine gave out, I'm going to take this so you can hear me a little more clearly. There we go. When the wine gave out, his mother said to him, they have no more wine. And Jesus said to his mother, woman, what is that to you and to me? Now there were six stone water jars sitting there used for the Jewish rite of purification, each holding between 20 and 30 gallons. His mother had said to him, or said, said to the servants beforehand, do whatever he tells you. So Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars to the brim. And they did, they filled them all the way to the brim. And then Jesus said, take some out and give it to the steward of the feast. So they drew it out and gave it to the steward of the feast. Now the steward of the feast did not know where the wine had come from that had been water. But the servants who had drawn the water now become wine out, they knew. And after he tasted the wine, the chief steward called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and then after everyone has become drunk, they give the poor wine. But you, you have saved the best for the last. This, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee. And he manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Well, grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The first of his signs... That's how the Gospel of John labels this story. I remember when I was a, a, a little boy, 
we went out on some family adventures, though not real often. Dad loaded up the 57, or the 57 Ford station wagon with kids and a little bit of food, and off we went to Wisconsin because our family had some friends on a dairy farm in Wisconsin, and we loved going to the dairy farm because of the destination, but we also loved the trip because you could go on those Wisconsin roads and they would go up like crazy and they would go down like crazy and as they would go down, we called them roller coaster roads because that was the feeling that you had in the cars. You would go down and then you might go up a little hump. And I don't know if it's actually true, but I remember that we were airborne at times. Whether we really were or not, that's something of which I cannot say. The other thing that we loved to do was to read the signs along the road. And some of you, like me, are old enough to remember the Burmashave signs along the side of the road. Slow down, Dad. We got we to gotta read the signs because we could see them coming. And there would be a first sign, and the first sign would say, a guy. And the second sign, a girl. The third sign, a car. The fourth sign, a curve. The fifth sign, this one bigger, he kissed the miss the next sign, and missed the curve. <laughs> and finally, Burma shave. I don't know how effective those signs really were. You, you know, the thing about a sign is a, a sign is supposed to point to something else. In this case, the signs were meant to point to Burma shave, right? We love the signs! But you know what? I don't ever remember seeing a can of Burma shave in our house. <laughs> and as far as I know, the brand doesn't even exist anymore. When we call events like the changing of the water into wine a miracle, it's tempting to look at the miracle itself. However, the Gospel of John wants us to see something of greater importance. So John calls these events signs. He wants us to see something more than water turned into wine. A wedding. Just think of all the wedding images that are in the Bible. From the first reading that we had today from the prophet Isaiah uh, to the parables of Jesus in which he spoke of wedding banquets and who all should be invited. Remember, invite the poor, the lame, the crippled, and the blind, right? And he even talked about where somebody was supposed to sit. You know, don't sit in the highest place. You just sit in the lowest place and then you might be asked by the host to move closer. In addition to those gospel stories of weddings, we have this image from the book of Revelation, for it speaks of the marriage feast of the Lamb who takes away the sin of the world. There are lots of images of weddings and banquets in the Bible. When you picture a biblical wedding, I want you to picture an incredibly joyful occasion celebrated throughout the village. Everyone is invited and hospitality demands food and wine. Many times it was that, you know, they would kill the fatted calf for that kind of an occasion. And they didn't have refrigerators. So, you know, once, once you killed the calf, you got to eat it, right? And so let's, let's have a party. That's what it amounted to. And hospitality is so important to this culture. You might remember once Jesus told a parable called the friend at midnight... A man hears a knock at the door in the middle of the night. It's a friend, a traveler who has come. And the householder, of course, gets up and welcomes his friend into his home. Uh, it might be a relative. Who knows what it was, but we, we know that this was a friend. And when you welcome this friend into your home, you have to set before them food. That's hospitality. That's just the way things have to be. But lo and behold, he doesn't have any food to place in front of him. So what does he do? In the middle of the night, he goes over to the neighbor and knocks on their door, wakes up the neighbor and probably his whole family. And Jesus said, I tell you, the neighbor will get up and give him food, not so much because he likes the neighbor, 
but because, and the biblical word for it is because of his importunity, uh, some translations have said because of his persistence, that's a terrible translation. Uh, the translation, imp, uh, impunity is right. It's because of the pickle the poor guy was in. He couldn't offer the proper hospitality, and the neighbor will help him out just because you have to have hospitality. It just has to be. And so that's the kind of thing that's taking place in this wedding at Cana. There is hospitality that has to happen. And when it is reported that the wine gave out, my goodness, this is just something that cannot happen. They have no wine. You know, there are a few times in the life of our Lord when many of us might dare to say, I think I know exactly what he felt like. This is one of those stories in which we might honestly claim such a kindred spirit. This is what I mean. The girls need a new basketball coach. Or the boys need a scout leader. The church needs Sunday school teachers. And guess where all the eyes are upon? Right? Or how about this one? There's an annual meeting coming up. And some of you are afraid to go to the annual meeting because you might be elected to something. Meanwhile, others of you are afraid not to go to the annual meeting because you might be elected to something. <laughs> In spite of all these possible scenarios, it's hard for me to imagine the kind of response that Jesus gave to his mother. It's kind of like a father walking up to his daughter who is taking her ease on the couch and saying, your mother could use some help in the kitchen. And the daughter would reply, well, what's that got to do with me? Or, or mother walking up to a son and saying, y you know, uh, your dad could use some help moving the snow outside. And the son says, what's that got to do with me, huh? When my kids were still young and at home, we have an empty nest now, we used to have a comic on the refrigerator, and in it there is this son standing there with his finger pointing up in the air defensively, and he says, in my own defense, dad did not say mow the lawn, he said the lawn could use a mowing. <laughs> okay? So all of us who have been railroaded have a bit of a kindred spirit with Jesus and understand the answer he gave to his mother when she said they have no wine. And his answer is simple and short and even a bit curt when he says, woman, what concern is that of mine? Next, Jesus orders the servants to fill the six jars with water, each holding between 20 and 30 gallons, According to my math, that's 120 to 180 gallons of water that is being changed to wine. And John makes the point of saying they were filled to the brim. And this is no small amount, right? This is not uh, communion at Christmas and Easter when he got a quart of wine and he divided up among hundreds of people, right? This is a lot of wine and it's on top of that which had already been consumed, not only is it a lot of wine, but it's really good stuff. So good, in fact, that the caterer calls the groom over. I, you know, I can see him putting his arm around him, and I don't know if he's congratulating him or chewing him out at this point. But he does say, you know what? Everybody serves the good wine first. And when everybody is a couple of sheets to the wind, then you bring out the cheap stuff but you've saved the best until now. Like I said, I don't know if he's chewing him out or congratulating him. But the one thing I do know is that Jesus made this huge abundance of very high-quality wine. And what I want you to see in this story is that Jesus is in the business of transforming, of making new all things including the people of God. 
I have used this story many times during weddings. I do so for a number of reasons. First of all, the story is alluded to in the opening prayer for weddings. Secondly, it is a suggested text to be read. And finally, this passage is the only time of which we are aware that Jesus was at a wedding. The reasons I like to preach on this text for a wedding is to call attention to this amazing work of Jesus. For he turns that which is ordinary and that which is limited into that which is extraordinary and to that which is of, in great supply. In weddings, I like to speak of the people who are being joined together as two ordinary people. And then I like to invite them to see God's extraordinary work. Just as he turns water into wine, and not just a little bit of it, but of great quantity, great stuff. So I also want you to see in marriage that God takes a good relationship and does something that is new, something that is transformative, something that is good and lifelong. It is the best of wines. Of course, what God intends for the covenant of marriage is also reflective of what God is doing in each one of you, the people of God who are touched by the Spirit of God, whether you are single or whether you are married. For the work of Christ is the work of bringing out of us who are ordinary people, new wine, new life, a new spirit, and in quantities that are unimaginably large. Now, if this isn't enough, like one of those commercials that we can see on TV, I have to say, wait, wait, there's more. You see, this story is proclaiming more than what God is doing with you and me or with marriages. This wedding became the occasion for God to announce that in Jesus, the vision of Isaiah is about to take place. It isn't here yet, for the hour has not yet come. But this, the first of his signs, points us to where we are going. And when that day comes, when that hour comes, it will happen during another period of three days. Then, in a three-day cycle, Jesus dies for the sake of the world and is raised as a vindication of his love for you and me. A love so precious that Isaiah calls it a marriage. This is the love that God has for you, O people of God. Hear again Isaiah's words. You shall no more be termed forsaken, and your land shall no more be termed desolate. But you shall be called, my delight is in her, isn't that neat? That's the way God looks at you. My delight is in her and your land married. For as the Lord delights in you and your land shall be married. For as a young man marries a young woman, so shall your builder marry you. So come to the wedding and join the celebration. I know this is a new song for you, although it is a very simple song, very singable. I will sing the first verse. I'm going to ask you to join in on the chorus and then join in also on the verses uh, after that. If you want to do the harmony, do the harmony, would you please? Come to the wedding, join the celebration. Come and rejoice with the happy family. No more objecting, no more hesitation. Come and rejoice, let your heart be free. Dance and wonder at the simple joy. Sing a little song about the day of happiness. Feel much younger as you lift stronger and forever blessed. Come to the wedding, join the celebration. Come with your friends 
friends who are near and far away. Come when you're ready, come with expectation. This is a feast, it's a wedding day. Dance in wonder at the simple joys. Sing a little song about the day of happiness. Feel much younger as you lift your voice. Feel a little stronger and forever last. Come to the wedding, join the celebration. Jesus is here with a wonderful surprise. Watch what he does with great anticipation. This is a vision of paradise. Dance in wonder at the simple joy. Sing a little song about the day of happiness. Feel much younger as you lift your voice. Feel a little stronger and forever blessed. Please stand as you are able as we confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of his sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. With the whole people of God in Christ Jesus, let us pray for the church, those in need, and all of God's creation. God, creator of the heavens and the earth, we give you thanks for the abundance and wonder of your creation. We give thanks for gentler weather and for this morning's golden sunrise, for snow-covered landscapes, and how even now in the midst of January, you give us the lengthening of daylight and the bright songs of chickadees to remind us that spring is coming. And you strengthen us through gifts of fellowship and community and inspire us through music and your word. Lord, in your mercy. In the 36th Psalm, the psalmist reminds us your righteousness is like the strong mountains, your justice like the great deep. You save humankind and animals, O Lord. How priceless is your love, O God. All people take refuge under the shadow of your wings. And you send us people like Martin Luther King Jr. and Desmond Tutu, champions of equality, justice, and dignity for all. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Through Jesus at the wedding in Cana, you show us you desire for us lives of joy and abundance. Help us to better understand what that means. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. So often the news warns us of growing scarcity and a climate on fire. But you have not left us at the wedding feast with empty wine glasses, nor have you condemned us to an earth in steady, irreversible decay. Rather, you imbue our world with your life-giving force, a force we are still just beginning to understand, a life force with the power to regenerate farm and ranch land and restore forests and seas a life force able to create endless possibilities when we learn to work with it. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Shepherd Christ, we lift up in prayer others in need of your comfort and healing, 
especially health care workers and others on the front line. Also, Judy, Butch, Janelle's mom, Jean, Lynn, Stacy, Paul, Fred, Ron, Jerry, LaVon, Harley and Betty, Kim and Jane, Linda, and those we now name in our hearts. You are a God of good news, and you say to all your creation, there is grace for you. I love you, and I'm always with you. Lord, in your mercy. Good teacher, you say to us, fill your jars with water. Fill them to the brim. Through us, you do the miraculous, enabling us to be vessels of your gospel of love and hospitality to all people. And through us, you renew this planet, its people, and creatures. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, gracious God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, our Savior. The peace of the Lord be with you. And I'll invite you to be seated. At this time, we would normally receive our offering, and we do have uh, our offering receptacle that's in the back of the church. I would also invite you to consider an uh, online offering, as, as that gets to be a very convenient way of, of doing regular giving to the ministry of God through this church. And with that, we can turn to our communion liturgy. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ. For by the leading of the star he was shown forth to all nations. In the waters of the Jordan, you proclaimed him your beloved son. And in the miracle of the water turned into wine, he revealed your glory. And on the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. And after he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, for this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in the remembrance of me. And after the supper, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of this, each of you, for this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you and all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let us pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And then I would invite you to receive the sacraments. Uh, and if you, if you need uh, bread and wine, uh, Jeremy will be glad to get that to you. Just raise your hand if you do. Over here, Jeremy. Anybody else? Okay, this is the body of Christ broken for you and for me. And the blood of Christ shed for you and for me.
and all the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in God's grace, now and forever. Amen. Let us pray. Jesus Christ, host of this meal, you have given us not only this bread and cup, but your very self, that we may feast on your great love, filled again by these signs of your grace. May we hunger for your reign of justice. May we thirst for your way of peace. For you are the Lord forevermore. Amen. Then receive this benediction. When the song of the angels is stilled, when the star in the sky is gone, when the kings and princes are home, when the shepherds are back with their flocks, the work of Christmas begins. To find the lost, to heal the broken, to feed the hungry, to release the prisoner, to rebuild nations, to bring peace among people, to make music in the heart. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Today we're going to end the worship service a little differently. The choir will be coming up to sing this little.